Hey everybody, two alpha gals here. I'm Debbie Nichols. And I'm Candace Mathis. And you're listening to In the Tall Grass, where we're sharing stories of reinvention, resilience, and rediscovering joy. Whether it's facing alpha gal syndrome or any other redefining chapter of life, we all have to learn how to navigate the journey through the tall grass. So here we go. Hey, everybody. We thought it was time to re-release one of our most downloaded podcasts. So this episode is one that you may have heard before, but it's our interview with Taylor Ernst. And the reason we decided to release this one again was because we hear from people all the time how Taylor's story really resonated with them, not only as a true picture of what it's like living with severe alpha gal syndrome, but also it's really a story of hope. So as you may know, Taylor is an avid hunter, outdoorsman, and alpha-gal syndrome really forced him to reinvent how this looks for him. So we hope that this will inspire you to reinvent your life and find joy again. So here we go. Hey, everybody. We're here today, and we are super excited about this interview that we're doing. Today, we're talking with Taylor Ernst, who is someone that we met through collecting stories about people living with alpha gal and Taylor, we realized is actually the very first person that we've interviewed on this podcast who is living with alpha gal syndrome. So welcome Taylor. Thanks for being with us today. Yeah. Thank you guys uh, so much for having me. Looking forward to uh, diving a little bit deeper into uh, everything we're going to go over today. Yeah, we are too. And I think let's just go for it. Would you be willing to sort of start with telling us your alpha gal story? You know, did you see a tick? How long have you had it? Can you just start at the beginning and sort of share the story with us? Absolutely. I mean, I feel like with, you know, with alpha gal, it's always kind of tough to go back to the beginning because you don't, you really don't technically know when the beginning was, right? You know, you know, when you're officially diagnosed, but there's, a very long in between period, unfortunately, um, from being bit and typically being diagnosed just because it's just such a unknown, you know, disease, such an unknown allergy. Um, I've done a lot of tracing back and I really think that, uh, I got bit probably a little over two years ago, two and a half years ago. Um, I was actually driving up to our family ranch, uh, out in West Texas and I was actually listening to a podcast. It's kind of funny how it kind of foreplayed um, into my sort of, uh, not demise, but, uh, but, but by, <laughs> um, I was listening to a podcast um, fr- fr- from another hunter um, going up there for spring turkey hunting. And uh, anyway, he, he was talking about how there was this allergy that you could develop from a tick and how it was a red meat allergy and how it was like the hunter's, you know, greatest nightmare. And it was the worst thing ever. And, Anyway, so we got up to the, we got up to the ranch, didn't think anything of it, thought it was a super interesting podcast, but really was never like, oh, this is going to happen to me or this, this, you know, this is actually even a possibility. I mean, I think the chances were, I can't remember what they were, but they were so low that it didn't even cross my mind. So we were actually sitting around the campfire that night and, um, you know, it was like 10, 11 at night and we were all just kind of like talking about, um, the drive up and, you know, how excited we were to, to get in the field the next day and, uh, we were talking uh, about the podcast we listened to, and that came up, and we were just like, "Man, could you imagine getting bit by a tick, and being, you know, a dude who loves to hunt, and then you know, becoming deathly allergic to red meat?" And we're like, "God, that would suck. Yeah, that would suck." And everyone's kind of like, "Yeah, you know, it's never going to happen to anyone." But man, for the for the people who do, like those suckers, like I can't imagine. And uh, so anyway, fast forward uh, another day, um, it's the evening, I guess the next day of the hunt, and. Anyway, I was sitting there and uh, we were calling in some turkeys with one of my one of my best friends. And um, I kind of felt like something on my arm kind of crawling up it. And I looked down and, and on my bicep, I had this and I knew it was a lone star tick was the only way you could get it. And I looked down on my bicep and I had a it was a big tick with a huge white dot on it. And, you know, we're being all quiet. And I was like, hey, hey Andrew, you know what? Uh, this is a lone star tick, huh? And he's like, hey, yeah, that's the one on the podcast we listened to yesterday. And I was like. And that's wild. And I just flicked it off my arm. Didn't think anything of it. You know, thought it had to be on me for a couple of days. Literally never gave it any second thought. Went back um, to my normal life. Uh, and about six months later, um, you know, didn't change any dietary restrictions. I mean, I literally never thought it ever since when I flicked it off my bicep, never thought about it again. Um, so about six months later, I started, you know, really just kind of feeling sluggish. Um, you know, I thought it was 
just, you know, maybe was getting sick or had COVID or something like that, but just was kind of feeling under the weather. And, um, and it would have happened really sporadically. Um, and so then something else kind of weird started happening in that kind of six month span. I started waking up uh, in the middle of the night between like two and 3 a.m. And it was odd. At first, it was like, you know, once a week, maybe twice a week. Um, and then ended up kind of expanding to, you know, three times a week, four times a week. But in my mind, it was random. You know, it was 2 a.m., 2.45. I'd always wake up, you know, cold sweats. Um, I would be shaking. Uh, you know, I would be really nauseous. Uh, my head would be spinning. And so I'd just go to the bathroom, just get in the shower and just turn on the water or, or just, just get my mind off it. And it would normally last like 30 minutes to an hour. And then, you know, that was kind of it. And didn't really say anything to anybody, you know, because it was only a couple times a week. And I was like, man, like it's probably just in my head, you know, I'm probably being a hypochondriac, you know, I'm not really sure what's going on. Maybe I'm just having bad dreams. I can't remember. And so, um, had knee surgery and, um, went back home, uh, to Huntsville. And, uh, this is the first time I remember having like a vivid reaction, but I had no idea what it was. Um, and so my mom cooked like pork tender tenderloin the last night I was there. Cause I finally got cleared to drive and go back up to Houston. And, um, that night I, I woke up and just got super sick and, um, just, you know, everything, essentially food poisoning, um, which was odd. And so couldn't really put two and two together on why it happened. But I was like, man, I guess my mom just gave me food poisoning. Like, yeah, I guess it happens. And uh, which is odd because she is just super, super anal about cleaning everything and, you know, making sure everything's well done. And um, I hope she's not listening to this podcast and saying I'm a, she's a bad cook. She's a great cook. Um, but I was just like, man, this is kind of weird. Um, so anyway, I didn't really think of it. It was like, okay, it's just food poisoning. Um, and so a couple more weeks go by and um, we do like a big grill out of my house and you know, I had a little bit of bacon in between there, but had, you know, a big pork tenderloin again. And I mean, within a couple hours, just started shaking, um, got really, really dizzy, um, super, super nauseous, couldn't really see straight. And I was like, you gotta be kidding me. I'm like, I got food poisoning again. So, you know, after a couple hours, it passed. Um, I was like, man, I'm gonna stay away from pork. I was like, maybe that's what it is. And so anyway, a couple months go by and, um, this is probably we're about eight months out from, I guess, the original take bite. And um, same thing happens. Have a little bit of pork. Wasn't really paying attention. It was it was in some, um, so it was bacon that was wrapped around something, a steak or something like that I was eating. And I mean, exact same thing. Within a couple hours, I just, I started getting the shake, started sweating. Um, my mind started just going like a million miles an hour. Um, just felt like I was just not in control. Um, got really sick, had to be at the toilet for a couple hours. And I was like, golly, you know, I've, I think I'm, I think I'm allergic to pork. So I started telling all my friends, I'm like, Hey, you know, I'm allergic to pork. And they're like, Oh yeah. Okay, sure. And so, um, anyway, uh, I'll never forget. We were, um, we were, we were going somewhere and, um, we were ordering food and I'm like, Oh, I, I can't have that. I'm allergic to pork. And everyone just kind of looked at me. They're like, dude, they're like this steak that we gave you last month that we said was steak. They're like, it was actually like a pork tenderloin. And I was like, are you serious? And they're like, yeah, you, like it's all in your head, man. And I'm like, really? And they're like, yeah, no, we, we've had pork like in your food before and we've told you it's beef and like, you didn't get sick. And I was like, huh. I was like, that's, that's really odd. And so same deal happened, had it again and got sick. And they're like, man, we think it's in your head. Like, there's no way this is like legit. Like it's all in your head. And I was just like, you know, maybe it is in my head, but at the same time, something's happening, but it was really sporadic, right? Like sometimes I could eat it. Sometimes I couldn't. Uh, and so I was just super confused. And so anyways, all this is going on you know, I'm starting to sleep less and less at night. You know, I'm starting to have more of these attacks at night and um, didn't change my diet besides cutting out pork. Um, you know, I go see a therapist regularly just because my brain is just going, you know, 300 miles an hour at all times. And I start telling her, I'm like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm like every, I'm like three or four times a week. I said, I'm not really sleeping that well anymore. So I'm waking up and I'm up shaking by the bathroom, you know, laying on the ground for a couple of hours. I said, you know, but I said, it's weird, you know, a week will go by and I won't have it. And then it'll happen six nights in a row. And I said, I don't know what's going on. And she's like, well, she's like, you know, let's look at, um, let's look at getting you on some medication. She's like, it sounds like it's panic attacks. And I was like, I'm a pretty high anxiety guy. You know, I'm pretty high strung as is, but I was like, man, I, I know what a panic attack is. I'm like, this feels like it's something in my body, like revolting. And she's like, yeah, like, let's, you know, maybe let's, increase your antidepressants let's look at this let's start adding some sleeping medication to your 
typical regimen. And so I was like, okay. And so the only thing at this point that we could like nail down was whenever I was on work trips and business trips, I always had a reaction, like without fail. I would wake up every single time. If I was in a hotel room, I would wake up and I'll lay by the toilet for like two or three hours a night, just shaking. And so that was really the only thing. So they're like, you know, it kind of makes sense because, you know, you're probably in high stress environments, you know, trying to close deals, you know, out of your element, not at home, you know, your body should probably waking itself up just because, you know, you're too anxious. And so got on some medication, medication, because I don't really like pills. So it had gelatin in it. Um, turned out the medication they gave me to, you know, quote unquote, stop the panic attacks, as they called them. Uh, made them much worse. Um, so my reactions went from three or four times a week to five to six times a week, normally every night. Um, and they just kept getting worse and worse and worse. And uh, I never forget, I went to San Antonio for a, for a golf trip and, um, you know, didn't know, knew, knew a lot of the guys I was going on the trip with, but didn't know everyone super well. And so the guy I was sleeping with in his room, um, I told him, I was like, hey, man, I'm like, I'm just letting you know. I'm like, I don't know if it's going to happen for sure or not tonight, but I'm like, you may like, I can sleep in the hallway, but I'm like, I'm letting you know now I'm probably going to wake up at 1 a.m. I'll probably be up till about 4 or 5 a.m. like shaking. I'm like, I'm going to try to be really quiet, but I'm, I'm letting you know now, like I'm having these crazy panic attacks at night. I'm like, nothing's going on in my personal life, you know, besides whatever normal people go through every single day. But I'm like, I'm letting you know now it's, it's probably, I'm going to try to be as quiet as possible. Like it's going to happen. And he's like, man, I'm so sorry. And so anyway, same deal happened, you know, had, um, and didn't think about it, but, you know, we grilled out that night as, as guys normally do on, you know, these kind of golf trips and, um, hanging out with the boys and, uh, you know, had a bunch of hamburgers and, uh, ice cream, of course, and, you know, just kind of went all out as I normally do. And same deal happened, you know, about one thirty, one forty five AM woke up just covered in sweat. I mean, feeling absolutely terrible. And, and it was a weird deal. It was, um, at this point, it kind of got to the point where it was, it was, um, it was weird. It was like, it was in my head. Um, and I would get up and I would pace the hallways in, in, in the Airbnb we're at. I would pace the hallways in the hotel. I would run up and down the stairs in my own house. Like it was like, my life was ending and, and I can't really put it into words, but it was like, and I've seen this actually in some scientific articles that have come out feelings of impending doom. And I remember reading that article much later on and being like, Holy crap. Like that's, that's it to like that's it impending doom i was willing to do whatever it took to get rid of this feeling and so everyone was telling me it's all in your head it's a panic attack it doesn't exist you know you've just got to learn how to deal with your emotions and these feelings that are coming on but deep down i knew that there's something else going on and so this kept going on and finally i just i just got to a point where i was just broken you know i, I was sleeping you know maybe two hours a night um i could go to bed at 8 a.m or 8 p.m I would still wake up. It did not matter what time I went to bed, you know, how hard I worked out that day. You know, if I cut out all screen time, if I cut out, you know, all nicotine, it didn't matter. I can cut out everything. Uh, it didn't matter how much sleeping medicine I took. Like I was not sleeping at all. And so, you know, sleeping two hours a night, three hours a night, like that really, really starts to put a wear on your body. And, you know, at work, I really wasn't able to be as efficient because I was just dead tired all the time. And, you know, I started like really just not feeling good, just in general, you know, I always had the spins, I was always extremely lightheaded. Um, and I started getting like really, really bad bouts of like vertigo, um, to the point like where I really couldn't see straight. And like, if I was trying to read, you know, stuff on the computer at work, it was like all the words kind of got jumbled up and I just did not feel good. And so I'm like, man, screw this. So I went to go see a bunch of doctors. Everyone's like, no, oh, man, it's in your head. It's a panic attack. Like you got to let it go. And so, you know, you keep telling people the same stuff over and over again. Yeah. They eventually you just start to believe in yourself. You know, you stop believing that anything's happening to you is real. And, um, to tell you the point I got, I got to a spot in, oh shoot, probably July, August last year where I was just like, man, is this worth living? Like I'm not sleeping anymore. I feel terrible all the time. My stomach's killing me. Like I can't see straight. I've got vertigo. I'm dizzy all the time. You know, it's getting, it was getting harder and harder for me just to drive my truck to work just because it was just like, I couldn't see. And, and it was just awful. And I just got to a point where I was like, nobody can help me. And nobody believes this is real, you know? And I, I've got some of the best friend groups, support groups in the world. And I've been truly, truly blessed in my life. I have great parents and, um, you know, that was the frustrating part was like, they couldn't do anything. And I think 
you know, you always kind of have that feeling like they don't really believe you, you know, um, which, which sucks. And I hope if they hear this, they don't get upset because I just have that feeling about everyone, you know, people at work, um, you know, I tell them like, man, I'm sorry. Like, I just, I'm not sleeping anymore. And you know, they're like, well, well, you know, you're probably pretty stressed about work and this and that. And there's just always these little like excuses just to kick all my feelings to the side. Like they didn't matter. And, um, anyway, I just got to the point where it was just like, is this really worth living? And so I had to think about it, pray about it for a while. And I was like, you know what? Talk to my therapist. And she's like, look, like whatever's going on right now in your life, like you can't control that. She's like, the only thing you can do is control the way that you react to it. And everything outside of that doesn't matter. You know, you can't control that. You can control, you know, hey, look, I might wake up and I might feel nauseous. I'm going to have vertigo today. I'm going to feel super, super depressed. I'm going to have feelings of impending doom that just are nonstop. I'm not going to sleep at night. But she's like, that's your reality. And if you can't do anything to change it, then change how you react to it. And so I was like, you know what? Yeah, I may only sleep for two hours a night, but I'm going to make this life the best life possible. And I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that it doesn't affect who I am as a person and that it doesn't affect my goals and that it doesn't affect, you know, the man that I want to become someday. And so I kept fighting it and kept fighting it and, um, you know, made a little bit of progress. I think just because I had gone from having absolutely no hope at all to like, you know what? Nothing's going to stop me anymore. You know, there is nothing that is going to stop me. I'm going to keep fighting this panic episodes, these manic episodes. And, you know, I was like, I will probably end up in a psych hospital in probably about a year, um, fully medicated, fully sedated. Cause I was like, I think I'm going to go insane eventually, but I'm like, I'm going to enjoy this last, you know, however long I have left. Um, and I'm going to try to enjoy it and I'm going to do everything possible to keep a positive mindset and you know whatever happens tomorrow i can't change that but i can control the day and um so anyway fought it and um on Oct in october uh of last year i guess i got to a point where my body just said no like you you are breaking down this is not working um and it was a college game day um we had a bunch of people over and it was one of my buddies um he was turning 30 and so we did a huge cookout we got up early in the morning you know put on a massive brisket, uh, mac and cheese, you know, pork tenderloin, um, cooked up, you know, elk steaks. All I mean, we, I mean, I can probably say, I don't think I've ever eaten that much red meat and dairy in my entire life. I mean, it was granted, it was awesome, but it was not awesome. Um, at the same time. So anyway, ate all that at about 6 PM. Um, and we ended up going downtown because one of my buddies was DJing downtown and it was an awesome day. And, you know, I got, we got there and it was about 1030 and, you know, we're all just kind of having fun. And, um, side note is I, I, I don't drink. Um, I've been sober for about three, over three and a half years now. Um, just, you know, had some substance abuse issues. And so anyway, we were going out downtown and, uh, my friend got me a soda water with a lime and, uh, about 1030, 11 o'clock, you know, my buddy was coming on a DJ and we're all having a great time. And man, I just kind of started getting that shaking feeling that I get every single night, except this time it was way earlier in the night. And I was like, man, what the heck? Like, what's going on? What is this? So I went to the bathroom, looked at myself in the mirror, splashed water on my face, like couldn't really see straight, but I was like, I am not going to let my panic, my emotions get the best of me. I'm like, I'm having a great night. I'm with some of my best friends in the world. Like this is not happening right now. And this is not going to rule my life. And I'm going to fight this and I'm going to go back out there. And like, I'm going to enjoy the night with some of my best friends. So I went back out there and about that time I like lost all hearing in my right ear. Um, and my face started getting super, super itchy. Um, it got to where I really couldn't breathe great. Um, uh, and I just got to where I was so lightheaded. I was about to pass out. So I went back in the bathroom, splashed more water on my face. I was like, Taylor, like you, you, this is fake. Like this is fake. Doctors have said, this is fake. Everyone has told you this is fake. This is in your head. Do not let this ruin your night. Like do not let this ruin your life. Don't let it ruin tonight. Like you are letting this fake, you know, disease get in your head. And so I went back out and and I grabbed the girl who got my drink. And I'm like, hey, so at this point, I was like, man, I think I got drugs. I grabbed her and I was like, hey, you know, what was in that drink you got me? And she's like, water. And I'm like, okay. I'm like, did you watch it? And she's like, what? And I'm like, did no one drugged it, right? And she's like, no, I had it in my hand the whole time. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm like, I got drugged. And I'm like, I'm about to pass out. So I'm calling an Uber home. Like I like something is not right in my head right now. And she's like, okay, well let's, let's go. And I'm like, no, no, y'all stay here. I'm calling an Uber. Like I'm gonna be fine. And so anyway, I like walked outside. I was trying to call an Uber and they all came out and 
they're looking at me and they're like, you know, what'd you have tonight? And I was like, man, I'm like, y'all saw me. I'm like, I really do think I got drugged. I said, I don't know what it is, but I said, I need to get out of my system. And I said, I, I'm about to pass out. I'm not about to pass out in downtown Houston. I can promise you that much. Um, and so we were sitting there and um, they're like, well, you did have some caffeine tonight. And I was like, yeah, I'm like, but I don't think that's it. And they're like, well, you know, you did have like hundred milligrams. And I'm like, well, I just used to slam like two Celsius a day. So I'm like, I don't think that's the issue. And they're like, well, you know, you're probably having a pan attack, but let's just take some deep breaths. We can go back inside. And I was like, man, this, this isn't a, and so they're like, well, you know, you did have caffeine. Like, let's just take a couple of deep breaths. And so about that time, um, we kind of moved underneath the street lamp and they're like, well, let me see your arm. And so I kind of pulled out my arm. My arm was just like blood red, like just splotches and just hives everywhere. And so, you know, they put a flashlight on me and, uh, man, my face was all swollen up. Uh, my beard was kind of puffing out. Um, uh, my arms was everywhere. I like lifted up my shirt and I mean, I was, my whole body was just covered in hives. And so at this point I'm like, Oh crap. I'm like, I did get drugged and I'm like, my body's not used to whatever it is. And so they're like, Oh man. So they called an off duty cop over and, um, you know, he's shining stuff in my eyes. He's like, man, he's like, your eyes are dilating. He's like, I'm calling an ambulance. And I was like, I'm not having an ambulance. I'm like, I, I'm not allergic to anything. And he's like, it's protocol, man. He's like, I, I, I can't, he's like, your eyes are dilating. He's like, you need to see someone. And so anyway, ambulance got there, um, paramedics rushed up. And at this point, you know, I'm really having a tough time breathing. You know, my throat just feels really hoarse and it, it just was swollen. So it was like hard to breathe. So I was like kind of trying to breathe out of my nose. And um, at this point, man, everything in my body's on fire. Um, I kind of start shaking and Anyway, they come and they come assess me and they're like, Hey man, you're having a serious allergic reaction. We're taking a hospital. And I was like, I'm not paying $2,000, you know, for a three minute ride to the, to the hospital. And they're like, no, they're like, it, it's best you get in the car with us. And I'm like, I'm not getting in the ambulance. And they're like, yeah, you are getting the ambulance. You don't have a choice anymore. And I'm like, okay. So we got in and, um, anyway, I thought it was really odd. You know, they put me in like the chair and it was just the most surreal thing ever. Um, I was going there and, I was just so, so scared. And, um, they only let one of my friends in there and I started shaking a bunch, like just like uncontrollably shaking, like violently shaking. And so they started strapping me up to the chair and I'm like, you don't do that. And they're like, no, no, no. Like you, we don't want you to bounce out and hurt yourself. And so anyway, they, they had to strap me down and I was shaking and, uh, man, I was so scared. I remember looking at the guy and being like, is everything going to be okay? And he was like, um, yeah. And I was like, no, no, I'm like, be honest with you. I'm like, am I going to die tonight? And he's like, dude, you, you are going to a great place. It's going to be able to help you. And I was like, I don't want that answer. I'm like, tell me, like, could I potentially go tonight? And he was like, we are going to a really, really good hospital. They're going to take great care of you. And we were driving there. And I remember like in the skyline, out of like the back little hole in the ambulance, um, there was like a lit up cross uh, from like a church nearby and it was just sitting there and it just lit up. And I don't know if we were a stoplight. I can't really remember, but I was kind of staring at it and being like, I think I might be going home tonight, you know? Um, and I wouldn't necessarily say I was peaceful about it, but or excited about it. But at the same time, I was like, I kind of finally get relief. You know, I might, if this ends up not going great, you know, maybe I do get called home tonight. And like, I finally get to sleep. And I finally get to be somewhere where it's like all these anxiety, all this, this stress, all this, you know, these things have been happening, like they're going to go away. And so we got there, um, the hospital super filled up. They like rushed me in, um, started like injecting me with, um, you know, getting my blood and, uh, I was shaking so bad. They kept missing my veins. So I had blood and stuff going all down my hands. And, um, my face was really, really swollen. And they're like, so what have you had to drink tonight? And I'm like, nothing and they're like okay you know what what drugs is he on she i mean i could hear the nurse asking my friend and, I, and she's like literally nothing and he's like okay she's like that's great but she's like we need to know exactly like what kind of drugs he took tonight and what out how much alcohol he's drank and she's like he is sober in aa and has been in aa for three and a half years he did not take anything and they're like that's great but they're like he's really showing signs of you know potential overdose or something like that or he's having some kind of reaction to a drug he took like are you positive and they're like, yes, he has not done anything. And I couldn't really hear what was going on. And so, anyway, of course, they took my blood because they wanted to see what was in it because they thought I, you know, was on stuff. Um, 
And so anyway, the, the head doctor came in and, and uh, he gave me, I guess it was, I don't know if it was adrenaline or something like that. Um, but I guess it was, it was something, you know, that they give to people who have allergic reactions. Um, and so anyway, that kind of seemed to kind of calm me down a little bit. Um, they gave me some more medicine just for, you know, just your basic allergic reactions. And they kept asking me like, what'd you eat tonight? And I was like, and I've had anything in like six hours, I'm like six or seven hours. And they're like, are you for sure? And I'm like, I promise you. And they're like, well, what'd you have to drink? And I was like, water. And I'm like, I guess technically I had a little bit of caffeine, like a little bit of pre-workout. Um, but I was like, it's nothing that I haven't had continuously for the last 15 years. I'm like, I'm telling you, I didn't eat anything, anything different than I've eaten before. And they're like, you haven't had anything to eat in the last six hours. I was like, I swear to you, I have not. And so, man, they ran a bunch of tests, um, kept giving me medicine. And so anyway, they ended up clearing me at three, um, got the call the next morning. Um, like, hey, you know, we've ran everything in your blood. You didn't get, you didn't get drugged. Um, you're showing no signs of, you know, having a potential, you know, OD, which I was like, oh, that's crazy. That's weird. I can't believe I didn't show any signs of that. Um, and they're like, man, we you might've brushed up against something at the bar. You might've come in contact with something in an Uber, um, you know, just stay away from there. And, um, you know, maybe it was, and so what they ended up pinning it on was they're like, you know, lots of times at bars, they don't clean the drinks that well. So, you know, there could have been some lime juice and you probably had a reaction to lime juice. And I was like, yeah, that's not it. I'm like, I know that's not it, but they're like, you know, we're sorry. There's nothing else we can do. And so had to, uh, took off the next couple of days from work. Uh, just because I was just tired, you know, I was just so oh, dead tired and I got really, really bad face droop for a couple of days to where like my face was stuck down, um, kind of like face, facial perilous or wh whatever it's called. And, um, just awful. And, uh, a few days went by, started going back to work and I was just, of course, not sleeping anymore. Um, waking up every night with my panic attacks. And at this point I was just like, man, my body is revolting against something and I have no idea what's going on. Um, so ended up, uh, at this point, you know, kind of given up hope. I was like, Oh, if this happens again, I'm somewhere where I can't get to the hospital. I was probably going to be it, but I have no idea what I'm fighting. You know, it's like going into a battle where you have absolutely no idea who your enemy is, but you're being attacked from every single side. Um, so I ended up running to one of my friends on the uh, walking trail and I was out walking my dog and, um, we got to catching up and, uh, I told her about everything that had happened and she's had a lot of health issues and she's like, Taylor, she's like, she used to be a professional soccer player. Um, it was like really, really good in college. And that was like her dream was go play professionally. And, um, anyway, she told me, she's like, I just got diagnosed because she had to quit playing, uh, professionally. She had to, um, you know, essentially kind of almost stop working out, stop doing anything because her body, her joints, her, everything was just failing. Um, everything was going out. She was in just an extreme amount of pain all the time. And they had to run tests for 10 years and just said continuously, ah, it's nothing, it's nothing, it's in your head. And um, so she had to quit, you know, her professional college career. And she told me, she's like, two months ago, she's like, they finally figured out what it was. And I was like, what? And she's like, yeah, she's like, I have Lyme disease. She's like, when they test for Lyme disease, doctors typically don't test the right way. She said, they always will test first for, the if you get the bite within the last six months it'll pop up but if you don't get the bite if you've gotten it you know more than six months before it won't pop up on the test that they give you so she's like they have been testing me for lyme disease for years but she's like they weren't giving me the correct test in case i've been bitten for more than six months before that previously and she's like finally i went to a doctor who's like we need to check her out for all tick-borne you know related illnesses and uh, actually give her like a full scope of testing and so she found out she had Lyme disease after 10 years of fighting it. And so she's like, I don't think you have Lyme disease, but she's like the whole manic episodes, you know, the, and I didn't realize that my blood pressure was just dropping off the face of the earth. And so that's what was happening at night. And she's like, you know, all these things that are happening. She's like, you need to go get tested for every single tick related illness you can find. She's like, get this test, this test. And she gave me like five tests to run for my blood. So next day I was like, you know, thank God, like I have something to, to look for. And so I went and got tested on Monday. Um, doctor called me at like 6.30 on a Tuesday, which is normally a never a great sign. And I was working out and he called. He's like, hey, man. He's like, yeah, what's going on? And we kind of small talk. And he's like, well, he's like, dude, your liver function, perfect. Great. And he's like, your kidney function, perfect. I'm like, awesome. And he's like, your cholesterol is just, I mean, for a 26-year-old man, you're killing it. And I was like, this is all great news, but 
why are you calling me at, you know, 730 on a Tuesday, man? Like, let's uh, let's get down to brass tacks. And he's like, but he's like, you were like a hundred times higher than the normal limit for AGS or whatever it was in your bloodstream, whatever they test for. He's like, so you have alpha gal syndrome. And I was like, what is that? And he's like, alpha gal, AGS. He's like, it is an extremely rare food allergy. He's like, you can only get it from getting bit by a tick. But he's like, you need to not touch red meat. And I said, oh, okay. I said, what, what does that mean? I'm like, oh, well, like, okay, fine. Glad we know what it is. What's the medicine? And he's like, man, there's no medicine for it. And I was like, well, th- there's no like aspirin or something like that I could take to make it better. I'm like, I'm not giving up red meat. Um, I'm like, you know, I had to give up alcohol three and a half years ago. Um, and, you know, one thing that I've truly found just so much joy in is hunting, you know, and just being out in nature, being out in the field. And I know some people might scoff at it, but it's just like, there's just something so beautiful about just like sitting out there and like, for me, it's not even going out and, you know, harvesting an animal. It's just about sitting there and just like watching things happen around you when they have no idea, you know, that you're even there. And, you know, I had found so much joy and, you know, obviously I had to give away kind of this old, you know, partying scene kind of let that side of me die um but i had found you know i feel like i had been given so much more and just you know going out and taking my friends hunting and um you know, going out to the ranch and spending three four five days out there and going on these hunting trips and um you know bringing back all this really cool like wild game meat and you know having a bunch of my friends over and you know just it was awesome you know i'd finally found like this new not escape but just this new like hobby that had given me so much joy and I was able to share with like so many of my friends and you know I had more fun just having people over and you know it wasn't really about the cooking it was just about like the relationships and he just told me he's like you know that that's not you can't do that anymore and I was devastated I mean I, I've been I've grown up hunting since I was 10 years old and, you know for me like everyone gets really pumped about you know July 4th Christmas man November 1st is my is one of the best days of the year that's opening whitetail season in Texas and um it was like all that got taken away from me and I got pretty depressed for a while. Um, you know, it was weird. It seemed something so simple, but it was like, you know, I, I found so much joy in it, you know, and um, I didn't get, I kind of got that. I felt like I had gotten that taken away from me. And so I was like, well, what about venison? You know, what about this deer meat? What about this deer? What about this? You know, maybe I can still hunt this. And he's like, anything that has a hoof, he's like, you can't have. And so that was, that was hard. So um, dealt with, you know, the reality of that uh for a couple weeks after that um went to a couple quote-unquote specialists in houston um you know just to get like what can i do what do i need to stay away from you know i don't ever want to have these reactions again like i want to sleep like i want my life back you know i want my life back so bad what what else do i need to avoid and so i went in and you know they told me like hey look man like you know and I, I, and I, they literally Googled it right before I got there to figure out what AGS was. I was like, I have the internet, like I can figure out what this is going to do, but I'm like, I need to know exactly what I need to stay away from, how sensitive I am. And I went in sure enough, he told me, he's like, Hey man, you know, you really just need to stay away from like hamburgers and, you know, don't eat steak anymore. But he's like, you know, as far as like everything else goes, he's like dairy stuff like that. And he's like, you're good. I was like, really? And he's like, yeah. And I was like, okay. I was like, I, I can, I can deal with that. So couple months go by again and same old story um kept having yogurt you know kept drinking a little bit of milk here and there um you know wasn't watching the butter that I was cooking my chicken in wasn't watching the butter that I was cooking my fish in um and um started getting vertigo really really bad and it would last for you know weeks on end of just I mean like I would have to lay down to get my bearings straight before I could get up and go to work in the morning um, and I was dizzy the whole time I was at work. I couldn't stand up fast, uh, but just felt terrible. And I was always horrified of going to a meeting with a client and like passing out. And so, you know, just cause I was so lightheaded all the time. And I just stopped telling people. Cause I was like, well, everyone has their answer. I have alpha gal. I'm not eating red meat. Like clearly like the vertigo, the, you know, the blood pressure dropping, like it's just all in my head. They need to figure out how to manage it. And everyone's like, well, you know, you're cutting out the thing you're not supposed to be having. So like anything past this, you know, your symptoms are all psychosomatic. And, um, a couple of months go by and I was at the office and, um, just started getting those feelings of impending doom again. Um, like I used to get every single night and, um, it was like four o'clock and anyway, I stood up and, you know, I felt terrible the whole day, but it wasn't anything new to me. I mean, I 
pretty much felt terrible every single day. Um, so it was just like, oh, whatever. And this is in February of this year. And anyway, got up, um, started really, really feeling bad. Hadn't really eaten anything out of the ordinary. I mean, I had my yogurt in the morning. Um, I had my turkey, which I later found out had carrageenan in it, which I am severely allergic to. Uh, it's the only plant that has alpha gal in it. Um, got up and, you know, we had just gotten a shipment of Dasani bottled water. And we know we don't get Dasani bottled water at, the, at work. And I had been drinking it all day. And so didn't really think, obviously, would have never thought anything of it. I had no idea that, you know, who the hell would guess that animal byproducts or you know, male byproducts are in water. Like that's stupid. Like that. No, you shouldn't have to worry about the water you drink. You do. And sit up and I went to my boss's office and, um, I guess I started turning off all the lights, um, for some reason and went to the kitchen and they're like, Hey man, are you leaving? And I just didn't respond. They're like, why are you turning off all the lights to the office? And didn't respond. Didn't really hear them. And I guess I went in the kitchen and started trying to splash water on my face to wake myself up because I'm like, I'm having a panic attack again. Like, let it let it go away. And anyway, I just started going black. And I just told them, like, hey, I need help. And they're like, you need help with, like, an email? What? And I'm like, I need help right now. And they're like, what? Do you need a phone call? Like, what's – what do you need? Like, do you have a proposal you want us to look at? And I just passed out, hit the door. Um, so they ran in there, and I kind of came to – and. As soon as I woke up, I started just throwing up all over myself and um, started overheating really, really bad and started kind of convulsing again, you know, started shaking really bad. I had to take off my shirt, my pants. I mean, I was just covered in sweat. Um, couldn't see straight, was just so weak, um, was throwing up a good amount. I don't know why. Well, obviously, I know why. Um, and so anyway, um, they put me in a chair. We rushed to the emergency room, um, sat there, had to sit in the stupid lobby for like four hours while I was throwing up all, all over the place. It was terrible. Um, went back there, um, told them like, look, this is what's happening. I have alpha gal syndrome. I think this is what this is. I don't know what I had that did this to me, but I'm like, I think I'm having a reaction. They're like, well, do you have any red meat? And I'm like, no. And they're like, well, that means it can't be alpha gal. And I was like, right. But I'm like, I know that's what they said to avoid, but I'm like, this is AGS, like to a T. I'm like, I've never thrown up. I don't really throw up from it, but I'm like, you know, I'm not normally this lightheaded and this dizzy, but I'm like, I, something's wrong. And so I had a fever that went to like 102, 103, um, which was really odd. Cause I never really, I get fever sometimes whenever I have reactions, but that's not normally typical. Um, so they hooked me up to an IV and ran a bunch of tests on me, did some like, um, you know, overall scans of my body. Um, and finally like the nurse came in and she was like, yeah, you know, you've got the stomach bug. And I was like, yeah, that's not it. I'm like, I want to run more tests. And she's like, we do. She's like, you may have to wait here another 12, 24 hours. And they didn't have any beds open. So I had to sit in the hallway with my mom. And I was like, I'm telling you there's something else wrong. And she's like, you know, there's some fluid in your stomach. Like you just have the 24 hour bug. And I was like, I don't know. I'm like, I passed out at work. I'm like, I can't walk. I'm like, I there's something else is wrong. They're like, well, you know, your blood pressure is pretty low. So, you know, you're probably stressed. And I was like, right. But, and they're like, you, know, you can stay here for like another day, but there's no guarantee we can get you in just because obviously, you know, other things are going to take priority because this is a, you know, it's a stomach bug. And so I was like, okay. So they, they released me about 3 a.m. And I went in um, as I was checking out and the guy was like talking to him. And I was like, look, man, I think I've got, I'm like, I know I have alpha gal. I'm like, I know you guys are saying it's this, but I'm like, I'm pretty sure it's AGS. And he was like, yeah, man. He's like, you know, I got a cousin who has alpha gal. He's like, this isn't what it is. And I was like, yeah, but I'm like, from what I've read on everything online, it's different for everyone. And he's like, nah, man, like, I know what AGS is. He's like, this is not AGS. Like, this is like in your head. This is a stomach bug. You know, you made it worse. Hate to tell you. And I was like, well, all right. And he's like, honestly, man, if it was AGS, he's like, there's nothing I can do for you anyway. He's like, the only thing I could do is build a time machine, go back in time and stop you from getting bit by a tick. And I was like, huh. I was like, that's helpful. I was like, thank you very much for being so uh so supportive and kind to this uh this wonderful thing that uh at this point has kind of been ruining my life. I was like, that's very kind of you. You know, thank you so much for your kind words and didn't have the you know, really the energy, I guess, to tell them off. Not that I would tell them off, you know, I'm just I, I just think I'm probably too nice of a guy, but um, I'm almost pretty upset about that. Uh, but she bit her tongue. So they released me and my mom went on a rampage. She's like, I, there's something going on with your body. And she's like, I think it's AGS. She's like, let's dig into it. And so we dug through more scientific articles, more Reddit streams, 
Um, found two alpha gals at this point, just tore apart the internet for the next three days because I couldn't go into work because I just felt awful. I mean, I couldn't leave my bed. And um, anyway, she's like, you know, Dasani bottle water. She's like, it's filtered through bone chart. Have you had that? And I was like, yeah, I have. And she's like, you know, look at this. She's like, you know, dairy, you cannot be having. And I was like, okay. I was like, I'm cutting it all out. And so anyway, cut everything out, except I didn't know about carrageenan um, and kept having the reactions a couple days after and finally put two and two together that like the turkey meat I had been eating for the last two months had carrageenan in it, which is so weird because, you know, we're allowed to have poultry, but you don't realize how much stuff is in the things that are supposed to be safe and how mislabeled food is. I've learned that vegan is unfortunately not always safe. And um, through a very painstaking process over the last six months, I've begun to realize like what ingredients mean, you know, and what all this stuff means. And, you know, I've been able to, been able to find some actual peace, which for me is huge because, and I, I know for everyone else in the community that I've talked to and stuff online, like that's all we want, right? It's just to be heard and to feel like we have hope because whenever you're out there alone and you know the closest people in your life are telling you this is fake the closest people in your life are like hey you know you're gonna get through it while they're giving you pork because they know you know you're making it up it gets pretty depressing you know and it gets really really hopeless and that's where i got and even whenever i got my answer i still wasn't getting my answers because people were not telling me what i needed to stay away from you know i had to find all this stuff on reddit I had to find all this stuff, you know, on websites, you know, I had to find all these scientific articles just to digging through, you know, Google search after Google search to keep myself alive. And you know, it was so scary at first and horrifying and awful. And it sounds so stupid because it's like, oh, it's just a food allergy. But it's like, man, people are dying from this and no one really has any idea what's happening. And no doctors recognize it. There are doctors that recognize it, but but none of them even really know it exists. They have Google, and so they might know the baseline of it, but there's no one really – there's some people that specialize, but there's not a lot in Texas, and it's scary. You know, I'm in Houston, which should be, you know, the medical capital of, you know, the U.S. I mean, they're one of the best, and there was – people here were telling me to drink milk. Like, that almost killed me, and what I can say is, you know, it's all about the lens you look at everything through, Right. Um, you know, I, I looked at it for so long as like, I just got the one thing that I really, really love to do in life and hunting taken away from me. You know, I got this whole kind of scene that I, that I had been doing, you know, multiple times a month, having people over cooking all this meat for them and like just hanging out and just a great time for all my friends to come over and just catch up on the week. And like, you know, we had this kind of hunting, this, this, this meat, this cooking to kind of bring us all together. And I was like, I, I'm literally losing all that. You know, I'm losing, I know this is a podcast, so you can't see around my room, but I've got deer heads everywhere. I mean, I'm, I'm losing like this whole kind of facet of my life. And through this kind of renewed lens, I've been able to see, hey, you know what? I can't do this, but like, I could probably share this with someone else now. You know, I may not be able to eat the meat, but there's a lot of, you know, hunters for the hunger. There's a lot of programs out there that like provide game meat for people who can't afford it or who can't afford, you know, typical food, right? And so they're missing out on these really important nutrients because they don't have the money or the household income to bring that about. And so through this sort of new frame of lens, you know, this last deer season, for example, um, I took some of my friends out and, you know, they didn't grow up hunting at all. And I got to be with them in the deer stand, you know, in the field when they got to harvest like their first animal. And like getting them to that point, and just being like, you know, they were in tears. I mean, it, it was one of the coolest things in the world. And so, you know, I looked at it for so long. It's like, this is the worst thing in the world that's happened to me. I am so, you know, unlucky. I mean, I've gotten so much stuff in my life taken away from me. Like, why is God doing this to me? Why is this happening? Why is it happening to me? Um, and I had people calling me, you know, left and right. Like, man, if there was anyone in the world that we know out of everyone that we know who we would say, you know, we wouldn't want to get this. They're like, you are the number one on our person on our list. And I have people coming up to me, you know, at get togethers and I didn't even know, knew that I had AGS. And they're like, man, my girlfriend just told me that you have AGS. And he's like, I looked it up and he's like, you are seriously the last person in the world that I would ever want to get this. He's like, I am so incredibly sorry. And you know, I, I just, 
I have nothing else to say except for, I'm so sorry that you had this. And, you know, at first it sucked, but you know, now I have this lens of like, you know what, I may not be able to do this, but I can share this experience. I've been able to, you know, I've been blessed with being able to do for the last 15 years with people who may not have ever gotten a chance to do it. And so I don't know, it's, um, you know, it's a journey and it's a day by day process and it changes. And there's a lot of adjustments to be made and lots of epi pins you have to have stored all over the house and lots of go plans, but man, I, uh, I'm in a weird way. I'm almost thankful I have it because it's given me, you know, a new way to look at life. And it's also given me so much sympathy for like the community as a whole and people who are also fighting extremely difficult, you know, food allergies to where they can't even get on planes, you know, because they're that allergic to something. And, um, you know, as odd as that may sound, I'm kind of glad that I've been able to like get this side of the coin and be able to like share all these experiences with so many of my like good friends, you know, and be able to share that. And, um, yeah, you know, it's not easy. Um, takes a lot of research, takes a lot of resilience, but you know, the one word that keeps going through and through my head is just resilience. And that's it. That's really what it kind of teaches you to be is it teaches you, you know what, you need to listen to yourself and you need to trust yourself. And if you don't feel good or there's something going on, no one in the world is going to be able to tell you like, oh, you need to get this fixed or like, oh, you don't need to listen to this doctor except for yourself. And so that's another thing like I've gotten from this is like, I've gotten a lot more confident because I used to, you know, whenever things used to happen to me as a kid or growing up, you know, I'd always just discard it as like, oh, like it's just in your head, Taylor. Like, you know, everyone tells you it's just in your head, so it can't be real. But now it's like, if I get a gut feeling about something, whether it's at work or in life or about a choice, like I'm going to trust my gut because it's been right and it saved my life. And um, yeah it's given me that as odd as that sounds. And um, yeah, so that's kind of my, uh, my story. So yeah, I really appreciate, you know, you guys having me on and whatever questions you guys want to ask, ask yeah. away. No, well, we are so appreciative of you just being super vulnerable and sharing so much of your story, because as I was sitting here listening, I had to like keep myself from my heart racing. Like I had such a similar experience as you like the waking up and like shaking uncontrollably like all of it Taylor like it's I think that's worth kind of noting or kind of driving home is that the symptoms of alpha gal might not only be GI or hives or swelling it can be a drop in your blood pressure and that uncontrollable shaking the feeling of impending doom. And it's terrifying when you're going through that and you have no idea, you know, kind of how to even pinpoint it. So thank you for sharing all that. I think that that's really important for other people to really hear the realness of your story from the symptom side, but, you know, also the advocacy. I mean, you have so many words of wisdom in that story and, I think one thing I would love to maybe just go back to is, you know, you, you are still, you are a hunter and did you ever have fear of going back outside? I think one of the things Debbie and I hear a lot from people that are newly diagnosed is how to get over that fear of like nature is healing. And we are like, don't stop, like, don't stop going outside. Don't stop doing the things that you love to do, but you do have to kind of shift out of that fear mode. And I'm blown away at how fast you've kind of done that. I mean, it took me probably three years, honestly, to not be fearful of driving by myself and things that I did on a daily basis. So do you have any advice kind of, was it your therapist? Like, how did you kind of get to that point of taking that step out of the fear? Yeah. Great. Uh, great question. Um, th- I mean, to tell you the truth, still terrified. Um, you know, I may sit here with a smiling face and be like, Oh, it's so easy, but you know, it's definitely not. Um, you know, because a lot of the places like I'll venture to, you know, I will be by myself in the middle of nowhere. And the closest hospital I, I looked at it was, is like three hours from one of my favorite places to go. And it's like, man, if you have a really bad reaction, three hours might be two hours too long. And so, you know, there is that constant kind of fear in the back of your mind, but, you know, at the same time, all I can say is you just have to be prepared. You have to know your situation. You have to know, you know, what you can and can't do. And at a certain point, like, you know, life is beautiful. 
right? And obviously, like, there are some very, very, you know, real issues with having this disease, having any, any, any disease in general. But, you know, if you let that fear run your life and kind of stop you from doing, you know, the things that make you you, the things that truly bring you joy, you know, you sort of let the disease win. And even if it isn't technically, you know, affecting you, you're having a reaction at that time, you know, if you stop doing what you love to do, um, you're sort of just giving it the upper hand. And obviously that doesn't mean go out there and, you know, eat a bunch of red meat and do this or do that in the middle of nowhere. Obviously not, you know, I, I come prepared, but at the same time, you know, that was one thing that I was talking to my doctors and stuff about and therapists about was I was like, something happens and I'm in the middle of nowhere. I'm like, there's a chance I may not make it home. And that's a very real possibility. But at the same time, like, I don't want to give that up because for me, that is just such like a soul refresh. And I feel like if I gave that up, you know, I'd be kind of losing a part of myself. And so, you know, being prepared is a huge facet of it, but also just having the mindset of like, look, like it's not ideal. Um, and this is a true fear and it's something I am scared of, but at the same time, this is not going to define who I am, you know? Um, and really just, you know, I'm a Christian. So, you know, for me, having faith is, is another big thing. And, you know, at a certain point, you can't, you know, you kind of hit a fork on the road and it's like, well, you can stay inside and be scared and, you know, never go out, never do anything. And yeah, you probably won't have a reaction or, you know, you can live life. You can be prepared. You can do everything you can to stop yourself from having a reaction, carry EpiPens and, you know, experience life and kind of how it's meant to be experienced and just trust that, you know, he or whoever you believe in has a plan for you and he's going to watch over you and, you know, whatever happens, happens. And you just can't let that control the decisions you make. And I will say on another thing that you maybe reminded me is like, as a guy, like crap. I mean, it, it is tough. Like the whole masculine, you know, the whole like big dog kind of syndrome of like, Oh, you know, we can't show pain. We can't show this. I mean, going to therapy was so, you know, just emasculating for me, you know, it's just in my mind at the beginning, it was humiliating, but I needed it. And so, you know, for so long, I, I put off, I didn't tell anybody about what was happening to me every night because I was like, this is embarrassing. Like, I can't even control my own mind. It's like, what, what are girls going to think of me? You know, what are my friends going to think of me? What's my dad going to think of me? You know, what are all these people going to think of me if I, you know, can't control myself? You know, if I keep having these reactions, I'm giving myself. And because of time, I thought I was psychosomatic. And it is really, really hard. You know, I feel like girls may have it not easier, but, you know, being able to talk about their feelings and kind of what's happening might be a slightly, you know, easier conversation to have to where like for me, it's tough because I feel embarrassed. I feel like I'm almost not as much of a man, you know, whenever I'm having this stuff happen to me, whenever I go out to eat and I'm like, actually, I'm, I can't eat. And they're like, why not? And I'm like, oh, I'm allergic to red meat. They're like, oh, what are you, some kind of vegan? And I'm like, no, I'm not. But like, and they're like, oh, well, you know, if we look at you wrong, you're gonna have a reaction. And it used to suck. And so I used to just be like, oh, I ate before or this or that. And I always used to lie about it because I was like, it's so embarrassing. And like people I don't know would be like, you just don't eat red meat. Like you don't eat dairy. Like, you know, kind of like what, what's wrong with you? Like, are you that much of like a nature lover or this or that? And, you know, it was really embarrassing. And so I stopped telling people I had it for a while just because I felt like I was kind of maybe not getting made fun of, but um, I just felt like a little bit less of a, a man because like I wasn't, you know, strong enough to take this stuff on. Um, and so that's been like a whole nother hurdle that I've kind of had to, not necessarily clear, but just like, accept, like, yeah, I am different. Like this happened. I didn't want it to happen obviously, but like it did. And so, you know what, if I don't feel good today, I'm going to accept that. And like, if people ask me how I'm doing, like, I'm actually not doing good. Like, I think I, you know, cause sometimes when I work out too hard, I, I think it's the histamines or whatever will get off. And like, I'll get super, super dizzy for a couple of days and you know, I can't see straight and I'll just feel terrible. And I used to just be like, man, you're such a wimp. Like you literally can't even go to the gym and push it. Like you used to, like you, you're so sorry. Like, and, but now I've had to kind of change that mindset to like, you know what? No, like I am a strong guy. Like I am a man. And this doesn't take away from any of that. Right. The fact that like, I'm willing to be open and come on and talk to you guys. And like, you know, there's so many people out there that need help. And if I let my pride get in the way of, you know, not telling people what I have or not telling people, you know, kind of the hand that I've been dealt simply because I'm afraid that they're going to judge me. Like, what if this story helps one person? And honestly, that's, that's what I pray. That's what my hope and prayer is for doing this is like one person will hear it. Even if it's just one person, like they'll hear this, go and get their diagnosis and it could potentially save their life. And like, 
it is a little bit embarrassing people telling people like whenever I go over to the house parties and stuff like that and you know, dinner parties and I'm like, I'm really sorry. Like I really can't eat your food. And they're like, well, you know, this and that. And I'm like, well, you know, I just truly can't, but you know, this is what I have. This is what I deal with. And this is my reality. And um, it is tough kind of being a guy who has that. So I wanted to mention that too, because it's harder for, at least for me to kind of talk about my feelings and sort of the whole pride sense. So. Oh my gosh, there are so many touch points here. Like, I don't even really know where to begin without turning this into like a six hour episode. (laughs) (laughs) But I'm so glad, I'm so glad that you said that because I think that reality is that it's different for men and women and you know we're two alpha gals right we're both female so we're giving our perspective it's so nice to have your perspective you know as and forgive the term but as a manly man right you know you're a hunter (laughs) you're an athlete you're all these things and you have to you have to really sort of reinvent what reality is for you I have a quick question for you how many when you were reacting so bad all the time how many nights a week were you eating red meat do you think or how many days a week how many oh gosh I had deer meat probably five times a week which in reality is probably not great anyway I was probably shortening my lifespan so I mean on the bright side I'll probably live to be like 140 (laughs) um, now that I eat so healthy and be changing my own diapers but um yeah probably about five times a week and then dairy seven times a week 100 percent Okay. And are you eating, what are you replacing that with now? Yeah. So that's been a little bit tough. Um, you know, I'm not a big fish guy, uh, but I have learned to eat fish. Um, so I will do chicken three nights a week. I'll do Turkey the other three nights a week, typically like ground Turkey. And then I'll do fish once a week just to switch it up. Okay. Okay. Uh, do you find that as you're getting back out there, you know, even though it takes facing fear to go back outside. Right. And especially now, like I've, I've been counting the ticks that I've seen on me or in my house this year. And I'm up to 13 just this year. Do you find that it's getting easier to go back out? Do you find that the fear is getting less? Yeah, I I definitely think so. Um, I mean, at first I was like, man, if I get bit by another tick that has AGS, I'm like, what's going to happen, you know, but like you said, you know, life's full of unknowns. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. And so just having to change that mindset of like, I'm not going to let this fear, you know, this disease run my life anymore. Like I'm going to live it to its full potential and I'm be the person I'm supposed to be. And um, it's definitely gotten easier, but I think that that truly just takes time because you have to sort of understand, you know, the disease, like what you react to, because everybody's different. And like, you know, you may not react for a couple of weeks, but then you might react to just, you know, smoke, you know, coming off a grill. Um, so, you know, it's gotten a little bit easier, but I think that's more of like a time kind of heals, um, all kind of thing. Um, but yeah. I think that's so good that you're saying so much of this too, because I know that there are people out there, we hear bits and pieces of your story and in everybody's story that we talk to, I think who's from people who are living with alpha syndrome. And I think it's so good for people to get to hear these things to normalize it for them. Right. Because we feel so excluded so much of the time, right? Like, I, like the vertigo, like who's associating that with an allergic reaction not a lot of people. So I'm really hoping that, that people are listening because I think that they're going to get little tidbits that are going to make them feel better about living with alpha gal syndrome, right? That there are other people out there who are doing the same, that theirs looks a little bit like somebody else's, because like you said, it does just run the gamut, both in the severity of reactions and in the type of reactions. And so, so it's good to hear, it's good to hear what other people are really going through. So thank you so much for being willing to share this. And like Candace said, for getting so vulnerable, because it's not easy. That's not easy for anybody that I know. Anyway, it's not easy for me. Yes, ma'am. To- to let your guard down and 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 be able to to share that and I'm sure I'm sure that by you doing that you are helping other people out there so so thank you yeah and I just yeah. want to add to that too is that vulnerability equals strength and if anyone refutes that they need to take a different look within themselves because you are strong and you are helping people by being brave and stepping into that. And so we're like really excited to see how you, you know, continue to thrive. You know, you're still kind of new in this. So I hope, are you feeling better now, now that you've made that shift? Are you doing better with not having quite as severe of reactions? 
Absolutely. Yeah. And it's kind of nice. You know, I've started to put back on some weight and yeah, I mean, the reactions of, I mean, I still have little ones here and there just from, I don't know, I mean, I had to change my shampoo, you know, body soap, toothpaste, everything like that, all the products, stuff like sunscreen. Um, so still learning a little bit, but you know, those reactions typically weren't as bad as, you know, actual like ingesting it. Um, so yeah, the reactions have gone down. I mean, I'd say for the most part, I've kind of got my life back. I mean, you know, I still, just in general, I really just don't eat out anymore. It's just not, it's just not really worth the, the juice isn't really worth the squeeze for me. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, no, it's, um, it's definitely from a reaction standpoint, it's definitely gotten a whole lot better. You'll still have your bad days, right? I mean, I think everyone does. Like there's just some stuff that's literally out of our control. You know, our bodies have this in them now. Um, but yeah, definitely gotten better. Good. Are you sleeping better? I am sleeping so much better. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's Good. crazy. The difference between two hours and eight hours. It's, it's so, you know, the body's just a mystery, but whenever it sleeps eight hours a night, you know, it's crazy. You feel better. Isn't that crazy? I, I remember yeah. when my, when I had infants, right. And then that first night where you get like a solid eight hours and you wake up, you're uh, like, Oh my gosh, this is how yeah. I'm supposed to feel. <laughs> I, I can conquer the world now. Yeah. Like, yeah. So oh, longer, I'm so right? glad. Yeah. Yeah. yeah me yeah. too. And I remember I didn't sleep just like you did for months and it's horrible and it's hard to get on top of it when you feel so awful and your body can't restore like mm-hmm. it needs to. So I'm so glad yeah. you're feeling better. So we want to end with the toughest question of all of our podcasts. So <laughs> what song in this moment or for all time brings you joy? Oh man, what a, uh, what a great question. Um, shoot. Um, or an artist or an album, if you need to kind of expand a little bit outside of just a song. Gosh, that is a great question. Um, I really like, I'm a huge Machine Gun Kelly fan, but that they don't, he doesn't have anything that would apply to this at all. <laughs> um, probably wouldn't be appropriate. Um, Take It Easy, uh, The Eagles nice. is a great one. Um, or Eye of the Tiger. I think those are just great songs. Um, kind of goofy, but uh, the Take It Easy is just a good reminder. Like, life's not going to be perfect. You know, just don't be afraid to roll the window sometime I'm down sometime and just take a couple deep breaths and just know like it may not get better, but like I can enjoy this. And then I have a tiger. just like, sometimes you got to get in the zone and you just got to scratch claw, fight your way out. And um, yeah. So I, I like those two songs a lot. I think that's great. I think that's great. And I think that they're relevant, right? To this conversation. <laughs> Well, Taylor, we can't thank you enough for coming on and talking with us. And I, at one point, like I looked at the clock because I was like, oh, we should probably be asking some questions. But it was so, I was so taken with your story and just, and just hearing what you've been through and how you've recovered from it and how you're overcoming it. And I just think it's gonna, it's gonna speak to so many people. So thank you for being willing to spend some time with us today. We really enjoyed it. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you girls so much for what y'all do. I mean, I've, Shoot, I, I wouldn't be uh, where I'm at, and I've told you guys this outside the podcast as well, but I mean, I would be so lost if I hadn't found y'all. I mean, it's just a website, right? But I would be so scared, and um, I probably wouldn't know half the things I know now about it uh, if it wasn't for you two, like, taking a leap of faith and being like, you know what? We both have this. There's got to be other people out there. Like, let's go change the freaking world. And that's what you guys are doing, and it may not seem like much, Um <laughs> But yeah, I encourage you guys to keep doing what y'all are doing because you're you're making my life easier every single day just by taking a step of courage and by putting your, you know, your vulnerabilities out there. So I really, really appreciate everything you guys do because it, it helps out so much more than you would ever see. So thanks for sharing that with us, Taylor. (laughs) Of course. Yeah. Thank y'all. We'll chat again soon. This is part one. (laughs) (laughs) i'm excited if you guys will have me back yeah hopefully i don't get booed off stage or anything like that next time but never never (laughs) (laughs) until next time all right thank you for joining us today on in the tall grass visit us at two alphagals.com that's t-w-o alphagals.com or you can find us on instagram and facebook at two alphagals If you enjoyed listening, please leave a review and help us grow this community. We're all faced with obstacles on our journey, whether it be food allergies or tick-borne diseases. 
You might outgrow the reactions, but you won't outgrow the person you become. Chicks suck, but life doesn't have to.